I'm Alan Murray, the CEO of Fortune, and I'm here with Tom Davidson, who is founder and CEO of EverFi, an education tech company. EverFi was on Fortune's first ever Impact 20 list, which recognized companies that address critical social needs. Uh, Tom, great to talk to you. Tell us what EverFi is and what the need is that it addresses. Thanks so much, Alan. It's great to be with you. So EverFi is an education technology company that builds out really powerful platforms that go after seemingly intractable social problems in the country. So if you think about financial illiteracy, if you think about healthcare illiteracy and the fact that kids aren't taught at an early age how to navigate a very complicated and ever-changing healthcare system, we go after areas like the lack of mental health services in schools um, and bullying and digital wellness and creating spaces where kids can feel safe online. These are areas, Alan, that are often left out of the school day. They have a huge impact on kids' long-term success. And we try to fill that gap by building really powerful mobile mobile, you know, based online learning programs that really capture their imagination and meet them where they are. And how big is EverFi these days? So uh, it's pretty amazing. We have about 3.1 million wow. students who get certified through our programs every year. It begins and ends for us with what's going on out at the edges in schools. Um, we're now operating across uh, the entire United States and all 50 states and also Canada and uh, recently expanded to programs all across Europe in wow. this past year. Wow. Impressive. So, look, we know the pandemic has had a dramatic effect on, on virtually every business, and education is certainly no exception. Many uh, kids were kept out of schools, learning virtually for the first time, et cetera. From where you sit, how has the pandemic changed education? So I think it's done really two key things. The first thing is it has highlighted this issue around inequity in a, just a glaring, transparent way. I think everybody's realizing the place that schools play in not just the learning for kids um, but and beyond their interaction, but schools are places where kids um, get their only access to health care. It often is the place where they get access to food. Um, it also is a place where they can find safe harbor in many cases during the course of a day. I think what we all really woke up to in this was the importance of teachers and the importance of um, the actual place um, for students to go during the day. Um, second thing that it did was I think it really highlighted the fact that there were these areas that if you think about the racial wealth gap in the country, if you think about the dramatic gap in access to health care that this pandemic has highlighted for all of us, I think certainly for us, um, it, it really presented an opportunity to build that learning layer that allowed this generation of students begin to learn about how you access the healthcare system, how you build wealth over time, how you um, access food security programs and things like that. Um, these are still incredibly inequitable services that um, when you think about um, access to these things for, for kids and their families, and I think it's an opportunity for us coming out of the pandemic to address it. You've written a couple of pieces for us at Fortune about the role that uh, companies need to play in addressing education problems? How, how do you see the, the corporate role in this? Yeah, it's a great question. So here's the deal. If you look at healthcare, if you look at energy, if you look at transportation, if you look at any of the major drivers of GDP in the country, there's obviously a thriving, thriving relationship um, between the private sector and the public sector in terms of innovation, investment, and beyond. I think if you look at education and what's happened in the last hundred years ago, or hundred years or so, you've got this enormous gap um, it, between just the public sector and the nonprofit sector, basically handling almost hundred percent of the job of funding innovation in schools and beyond. Um, one of the things that we see is that there is a very, very important role for companies to play, not just from a dollars perspective but getting very much behind things like upskilling, things like closing this learning gap, things like investing in content in areas that are critical to the jobs that are gonna come in the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years. 
And so what we're seeing, and certainly what we've been a part of in the last 12 years or so, has been to try to pull the private sector into that, to say, listen, you know, it's not, it's not just good enough to sponsor the baseball team or put the scoreboard around the track or do these various areas. You need to fund these areas that are part of the school day, content, technology, access to broadband, these things. You can't just leave it up to the public sector. And here's why. Um, one of the things that happens, you know, I'm a former, Alan, I was in a former life, a state legislator, and, and one of the real driving parts of our mission has been that you can't depend on the government and the private and the public sector um, for consistency. And what happens is you've got huge upheaval when you get a new president, when you get a new governor, when you get a new education secretary or superintendent. What happens is there's this yo-yo effect of funding um, and this whiplash that parents have to go through that they can't depend on things biannual budget to biannual budget, both on a very localized basis, which is where most of this plays out, and a statewide and a, and a countrywide basis. So the private sector can actually step in and create a much more consistent funding mechanism. And we've really found that as we brought partners on to fund these important initiatives They've stayed 10, 11, 12 years in many cases um, funding this consistently. And, and do you find more and more companies are willing to step up and help with this? Yeah, and certainly now. I think, um, listen, the confluence of events that happened um, during the pandemic, um, but really just have been around for a very, very long time, um, um, have really come to the fore here. And I think companies are realizing that they need to step in very specifically to support schools. And, um, and so you're seeing hundreds and hundreds of millions, billions of dollars going to new initiatives. And it's really created this concept of technology companies um, being able to step into this area that we've really yeah. pushed called impact as a service of thinking about, you know, the classic elements of technology, um, getting underneath companies, and allowing them to do this more efficiently, report on it, um, because it's never going to go back to the way it was before. You certainly see more and more companies thinking more uh, carefully and openly about their social impact. But what exactly do you mean by impact as a service? What is impact as a service? So one of the things you've seen is um, technology, obviously, and software as a part of that has just transformed our lives. It's transformed, you know, everything from ride sharing to, you know, temporary housing to obviously the back office and automation around delivery of goods. And, and, um, and it's high time that that came um, to social impact, corporate social responsibility, ESG, um, because what you've seen is this hodgepodge of companies having to go out and really harvest the parts of hundreds of different things, you know, and, and, and frankly, a very boring, you know, two pages in the back of the annual report every year, which, you know, shows somebody standing up with a large check and giving it to somebody on the stage at, at the local community center. And we just think those days are over. We think that um, really what impact as a service is companies using technology to do a couple of things, to upskill their workforce, to build a learning layer in their communities and for their stakeholders, um, to report that to boards of directors and institutional shareholders and other people who are going to demand far more transparency about everything from your efforts to get to carbon zero, to what you're doing to train your workforce in unconscious bias or harassment training or whatever it might be from an internal basis. We think that software is going to just um, absolutely pour kerosene on those efforts um, and, um, and be able to build something that's far more scaled and transparent for all of the stakeholders that are part of these companies. That's really interesting, Tom. As you know, what happens as you move into the corporate sector is they're going to demand a return on their investment. They're going to want to see the metrics that show that what you're doing at EverFi has a real impact. Can you provide that kind of, of proof uh, that you're having an impact? Yeah, we can. You know, an amazing, um, amazing example of that is Mass Mutual Foundation. Um, Roger Crandall and Dennis Duquette and others got behind a massive countrywide initiative to teach kids financial literacy in middle schools. We brought in a university partner um, to study that from a third party, you know, arm's length basis to show what could happen to um, the increase of savings and financial security and saving for college and establishment of 529s and other areas 
Um, and it w- there was a huge movement in that. And, um, and that's going to pay enormous dividends in, in, um, in both closing the racial wealth gap in the country, creating, um, you know, we have a savings crisis in this country that's, um, it's just unbelievable. It's beyond words. And so we have to create um, new ways to scale this and get this learning in the hands. And they were able to show that if you did that, it actually worked over a five-year period of time. We're doing that all over the place with our various programs. And Tom, what did it mean to you to see EverFi on Fortune's first Impact 20 list? Well, you know, Alan, we started this um, company in the back of an RV with $800. <laughs> we were all dead broke. And um, my two partners and I really just wanted to build this learning layer in schools that we thought was completely missing um, for kids. Um, we started in Tuskegee, Alabama, moved over into the Alabama Black Belt and, and Clarksdale, Mississippi and Native American reservations. I don't think that um, in a million years we would have thought that um, we would be highlighted on a you know international stage um, the way we were lucky enough with you and your team. Um, but I think what's more important to us is that we believe so much that this layer needs to exist in schools for kids. And so any chance that we get to put that in front of Fortune, you know, 500 CEOs and other people who have a far bigger brand and a far bigger presence and a larger historical record than we are, we want to be behind the scenes powering that movement. Um, so it meant the world to us and, and we hope we live up to it. You still have the RV? Still got the RV. You know, it still drove. I drove in an RV last week uh, visiting school. So, um, so I'll never, I'll never leave that. And it keeps, it certainly keeps us grounded. Great. Well, it's an impressive story, Tom. Thanks for sharing it with us. Thanks so much. 